Good evening, everybody. We're up here joking about being a parent and how things change when you become a parent. Praise God. Well, tonight's the last night of the revival, folks. I don't know about you, but I want to finish on an extraordinary note. I want to see that the fullness of that which God has for each of us throughout this, the course of this revival be completed perfectly. That is my prayer. I hope you will join me in that and that will come into his presence as the ladies lead us there in song. You know something that's been cool to see this week? Is there was a lot of burden at the, end of, at the beginning of this week as people came in. A lot of weariness, a lot of weight that people were carrying. But I've noticed as in yesterday and today how people's countenances have begun to brighten as the Lord is working a work in each heart to draw us nigh to him and to change our hearts. And for that, I'm most thankful, as I hope you all are too. So where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom. Freedom from what? <coughs> Cares. Whatever's got you. Yep. So, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Let's sing it. Sing it. Loud. <coughs> the Lord is there is freedom where the spirit of the Lord is I'm free. 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 I'm free.
Steve's been talking about this week has been about humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord and him lifting us up. We're going to sing, we want to see Jesus lifted high because <clears throat> when we see him lifted high, it's because we're humbling ourselves and that means he will be lifted high A. in A. Yes, take it away. Wanna see Jesus? 
Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know, He is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know, He is the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward, little by little taking ground. Every breath a powerful weapon, strongholds come, tumbling down. High, a banner that flies across this land That all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven We want to see, we want to see We want to see Jesus lifted high We want to see, we want to see We want to see Jesus lifted high Step by step we're moving forward, little by little taking ground. Every prayer's a powerful weapon, strongholds come, tumbling down and down and down and down. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all they might see the truth and know. He is the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Amen. Praise you. One thing, if you're around here long enough, you know, I don't know when they're finishing. We don't have any particular schedule on any of these things, so praise God. Why don't you guys turn to... Galatians chapter 2, chapter 1, excuse me, Galatians chapter 1. I want to show you a couple things as we wrap up here tonight. And, uh, you know, I've been out praying all day and different types of things and stuff like that. And, of course, never thought of Galatians at all, let alone chapter 1 or chapter 2. Until just while we're in here singing some songs. So that's the way it goes. Praise God. All right, I want to, I'm going to begin with verse 1. Okay, if you remember, on the first night of the revival this year, one of the things is we didn't really get into the Scripture a whole lot, did we? I mean, I talked about a lot of scriptural points and things like that. I shared Brother Davey's testimony somewhat and laying some things out. And uh, just showed you guys the word from a different perspective because, you know, I think a lot of times particularly in this generation, um, this generation has been raised, and when I say this generation, I really mean pretty much all the generations since World War II. Now, I admit, I think your experience might have been a little bit different in some ways on this. Um, but quite generally, one of the things that came up with people who had come out of the Great Depression was the desire, if at all possible, to see to it that their children didn't experience the same struggles they had experienced. Whereas as a history, as a nation, people never despised the struggle. That was always considered a part of it, and actually one of the most valuable parts of things. The most valuable lessons we generally learn in our life are the ones we had to struggle, and sometimes we had to suffer before we learned. 
Um, but somehow or other, people got the bright idea that life's supposed to be easy. And people started doing all sorts of things. And you can kind of see it. I mean, what was interesting to me, I mean, it's the logical consequence of that was the 1960s with drugs, free love, all the different things were about please me, please me, please me, please me, please me, please me. Um, no, don't, anything that does not please me, I don't want any part of. And so we've grown up in a time in which pretty much all of the generations, unless you're like 90 or something like that, um, have grown up in a time where struggle was like bad and not struggling was good. Doing what you wanted was good. Doing what was the right thing to do, bad, if, it didn't, if I didn't want to do it. You know, most children and the like would have grown up back in the day, they'd have grown up something like doing the dishes, planting the field, harvesting, milking the cows, you know, doing all of the different things that needed to be done in a household would have all been things that it was just expected that you did that. As soon as you could do anything, you contributed something. And then you had this whole idea of no, 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 they're children. What's odd is I can tell you as an adult, the things that are the things I remember with the greatest thanksgiving from my childhood was getting up at 4.30 in the morning when I was nine years old, seven days a week, every day of the year, to go deliver newspapers. And taking that newspaper, and it was the Washington Post, and taking it and delivering it on my bike to each household exactly where they wanted it. Some wanted it in their mailbox. Some wanted it on the front doorstep. Some wanted it just inside like the porch door. You had to remember what everybody wanted. And then what you had to do is you had to go through the neighborhood every month and collect for the service you had done. And all they paid you, all they paid you was they paid you, if it was $5 a month to have the newspaper delivered, they paid you $5. And you had to buy your newspapers out of that and like, you weren't making a lot of money. But as far as learning skills that were extraordinarily valuable in my life, they were valuable when I played basketball. When I was like captain of a basketball team, they were valuable because I understood responsibility. I understood things that took sacrifice. I mean, get up at 4.30 in the morning, you can go to bed as late as your friends. You know, they were going to bed later. You, got, you went to bed early because you're getting up at 4.30. You're working a job every morning before you ever go to school. And then some of the different things, and I don't consider, I consider my life to have been extraordinarily easy, just so you know. I mean, I, I look back on that, and I don't look at it as something that was hard or I begrudged it. I was shocked when I moved to Vermont and adults were delivering newspapers. I was like, what? They don't let kids deliver those things anymore? I was like, Really? I, to me, I was thinking, that's silly um, when I got up there. But I share it with you from the perspective because I certainly grew up in a time in which we were already moving far away from what my own parents had grown up in. But I had a remnant of what they had grown up in on different things. And when I look back in the lessons I learned, those are more valuable than the time I played with my friends, the time I played. I mean, I played every sport you could play. So I was playing basketball, I was playing football, I was playing baseball, I was playing tennis, I was playing golf, I bowled, I did everything. Every time there was a sport you could play in some competitive environment, I was playing it. And I love sports. I did it all the time. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was a full-fledged kid. The kids around here don't think that was possible. They think I was, I'm, I was born an old man. I think it's kind of funny. <clears throat> but, um, I share it with you because, yeah, there was some struggle on different things, and it was extraordinarily valuable. And we've talked about this week, look, humbling yourself. Today they think that we've got to build children's self-esteem. You know, a child with a bad self-esteem has got a problem. No, the problem is children have too high self-esteem. They can't, they can't do anything, but they all think they can I remember I hired a bunch of young Vermont lawyers. I, I had a lot of people come through my office, and the thing that was just so maddening is I was like, oh my God, not a one of these people know how to do anything. And they're expecting me to pay them 
basically 80% of what I was making for accomplishing nothing but costing me more time and energy trying to teach them stuff. And so the only people who can really hire you up there in Vermont when I was working is the larger firms because they can afford to take you as a lost leader. We know you're not going to accomplish anything this first year, but we've got 20 or 30 other attorneys, so we'll be able to cover you, and then the second year, we'll start getting something out of you. But it was, you know, by contrast, when I went to, when I graduated from law school, I worked my way through law school. So I was working. I'd been doing legal work. I had worked in the International Trade Commission. I'd worked at a place called Miles and Stockbridge. I'd worked at Sidley and Austin. I'd worked at a place called Wiley, Ryan and Fielding. I had worked again at Sidley and Austin. I'd worked at these places while I was going to law school. You know what that meant? It meant that I uh, didn't have the same amount of time to do things as my classmates. Oh well, tough. I paid my way through law school. They might have had parents or somebody else paying them. I didn't. I paid my way, so I worked. And I gained experience when we went in for job interviews and we went to do work, let me just tell you, People wanted me because I knew what in the hell I was doing. <laughs> I had been doing it already. You follow what I'm saying? I had experience doing stuff. I had had to struggle in ways they had not. They would drive BMWs to school. I'd ride my bike. You know, they had places. They stayed in nice places. I stayed in a place, lived below the poverty line. They were struggle. I made all my own food. I cooked all my own dinners. I made all my lunches. I ate my breakfast at home. I didn't eat out. I walked to places when my bike got hit and I couldn't ride it anymore. Um, you know, I mean, that's how I got around. Well, you know what? It was great. I, I personally, some of my fondest things were all of that. Um, I, 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 never, I never despised struggle. I never, I actually came to, even as a child, when you play, I played on good sports teams, so when you played on good sports teams, what happened is you did very little of what people think is fun about a sport. Almost all of what you did are the things people think is bad, like wind sprints, fundamentals, defense, 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 defense. No, let me hit the ball, defense. Let me hit the ball, defense. Let me shoot the ball, defense. Let me shoot the ball, defense. Pass the ball. And we did this for hours and hours and hours. And we ran and we were in condition and we went through all of these different things. But when we played in that game and there was another team on the other side and we all of a sudden, now you didn't have to tell me to tell the guys to shoot the ball. Everybody wants to shoot the ball. You follow what I'm saying? Everybody wants to hit the ball. Everybody wants to do these things. But every other thing you have to do in a game to win that game, we had done so many times. We had just done them so many times that we were able to do them without even thinking. When you got tired at the end of the game and it got tense and it got tough and you had to continue to shoot foul shots with the same motion and with the exact same thing as though you did on the first minute of the game so that you didn't hit it with a lower arc, you didn't do it, but you would make them when the time counted as a 12-year-old. We did all the things to make sure in those moments we were ready. And to me, there was nothing more exciting than being in those moments. That was the whole reason why you did it, is so you could be playing for that championship. You could be doing these things. That was exciting. Being a part of a team, playing with guys who were good, who really pressed you and made you work harder to be the best you could be, that was exciting. All right, you got better at everything. You had to try out. Most of the people got cut. So you didn't just make the team because you tried out. You had to be good to make the team. And that was, it put you through challenges and things like that that developed the kind of character that you need if to succeed in real life. It's the kind of stuff you need to succeed. You need to be able to work as a team. You need to be able to knuckle under and give your best even when you don't feel like it. You need to kind of take one for the team sometimes. There are things you have to do in sacrificing of yourself for the benefit of what you're accomplishing that you have to do, and you learn all that stuff through such things. I mean, I can tell you, the newspaper, people didn't look at the newspaper and go, well, you know what, Steve wasn't feeling well last night, so it's okay that the newspaper didn't come in this morning. No, they expected the nine-year-old to deliver the newspaper every single day. 
If it was raining, they expected it to be delivered. If it was snowing, they expected it to be delivered. It was to be delivered every single day. You had to figure out how to get it there on time beforehand. So if 4.30 was the time you got up when it was nice weather, when it was bad weather, you might have to get up earlier than that. So you'd plan and get there ahead. I share these things because that would have been normal. I mean, I'm guessing for you, Edmund, and stuff like that, some of the things I'm talking about, I know you didn't play as much in sports and everything, but doing stuff and working hard and expecting to do it no matter how you felt and stuff like that, was that a part of your life? I mean, that's just the reality. The stuff didn't get to take care of itself. You had to get it done. And you learn. So, I mean, I, it was a, there was struggle in that. And my parents didn't despise the struggle. My dad's attitude was this. I'd be sick, and I'd feel awful. And my dad's response was this. Some of my best days, Steve, were the days in which I felt the worst, because then you got to focus even more. That was my dad's comment. There was no idea of, well, that's all right. You don't do it. The idea was you do even better when you're feeling lousy. That was the way I was raised. It was the way in which people were once raised. It was the way in which people made sacrifices for their families that their family could have what they needed. I loved Abraham Lincoln's story. The guy, his, he was a tall, strong guy. He was a better wrestler than everybody. He was a better worker than most of his peers and things like that. He came from one of the poorest families. His father was a really poor businessman and farmer, so he failed multiple times during Abraham Lincoln's life. And one of the things he used to do is he used to lend Abraham out to work for people. And so Abraham would go work all day, and the person would pay him, and he'd give the money to his dad, who took all of the money, none of it going back to Abraham, every single time. That's how he did it, his job. When Abraham, when his father, on the last time they were having to go forward and the family was starting all over yet again, Abraham had turned 18 and he wanted to go out on his own. But what he did is he went and stayed with his family until he got every, everybody was up and started in the new life. And once everybody was up and started in the new life, then he went and started his other. See, he was willing to serve others before himself. Isn't that what the scripture teaches? He that will be greatest of all shall be servant of all. See, these are things that it's taught. Now, what happens is today, getting anybody, do we have a volunteer to do the dishes? All the children scatter. Right? And then if they don't scatter and you start looking at them, the next thing is, well, I did them yesterday. Well, I did the thing, I did this th this morning. Well, I did that. Does that sound like somebody who wants to serve others? Or does that sound like somebody who wants to be served themselves. They still want to eat, right? They still want all the benefits. They just don't want any of the costs. Anybody who's an adult knows there's, that's not a life that exists out there. It does not exist. If it exists, it exists in some rarefied air in which none of us are inhabiting. Okay? Let me just put it to you that way. Um, and I share this because it's we have to, the, the walk of faith is a fight. Who here grew up and thought, you know what, when I grow up, I want to fight every day of my life? Let's see a show of hands. Who was looking that way? Who was like, please, I want to have to fight every day of my life? I don't see any hands going up in here. Look at the Apostle Paul. What did he say? I have fought the good fight of faith. We read last night the soldier that it, he does not entangle himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him whom hath called him to be a soldier. All right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. So what we have to do is to fight that fight, you have to humble yourself. You don't fight that fight by attacking the other person. But the other person's wrong. But that's not how you win. You don't win by attacking them. Well, then what am I supposed to do? They're so annoying. They're like, what do you do when you see a fly in a, in a room? You take a fly, it's flat, and you're happy. 
Well, that's how people treat people who annoy them. They're happy when they manage to shut them up. They don't think about the fact that that person's a living soul right there who Christ died for, and they just ain't wrapped too tight. They don't know how screwed up they are. They have no idea. You do. But because when you look down on them, then you can't help them. When you look up at them, you have compassion on them. Why do you look up at them? It's because you realize every good thing you have, even those things, me doing a paper job when I was nine years old, you know what my mom used to do? She used to deliver, and I used to help her when I was even younger than that. She used to as a part-time job, and she would do it, um, and I'd help her after school and stuff like that. She delivered the advertiser. And we'd go into apartment buildings together, and I'd go down this floor and deliver one to every apartment, go around the hall, and she'd go down the other side of the hall, and then we'd go down the flight of stairs to the next and go all the way around and then to the next, and she did that. So I learned how to be a paper boy working with my mom when, she was even young, when I was even younger. And so then the opportunity, my, a guy who became my brother-in-law, he was my sister's boyfriend at the time, not Robin. Um, he is Barnes, who, Mr. Barnes, who was Patrick and Jennifer's father. He had been a paper boy, and then he gave up, and he started driving the paper truck to deliver the papers to the other children. So I took over part of that route. That's what I did. To me, that was exciting. I had never done it before, but a friend of mine had had a route, and I spent the night at his house, and we all got up early and went running around doing the papers. So I knew what it was like. I was like, yeah, I can do this. You know, it was exciting. I didn't consider it child abuse or something. I considered it fun. It's just the truth. I mean, I didn't stop me from playing basketball. It didn't stop me from doing all the other things. I did that too. Now, I want you to turn to Galatians 2, and we're going to start with verse 1. Because on Monday, I talked to you a little bit about Brother Davy and some things. And it says, Paul, an apostle, of, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Now, think of that. Most people today think to be an apostle, you have to have walked with Jesus on this earth. Right? Isn't that the common belief? If you're an apostle, you had to walk with Jesus on this earth. Well, Paul was an apostle, and he didn't walk with Jesus on this earth. In fact, after Jesus rose from the dead, he was killing Christians. So we know he wasn't walking with them on this earth, right? We know that. Now watch that. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Let me ask you, you think the Jews might have ever thought, well, we've got Moses' law. Why are you writing this other thing? Who are you telling me what to do? Think anybody ever thought that way about them prophets? Who are you? Who are you? And every new one, who are you? I mean, okay, we know that Samuel was of God, but who are you? Well, my name's Jeremiah. Well, who are you? Your father wasn't a prophet. You're right. You know, that's how people are, right? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you to tell me? Who are you? What do you know? How do you know that? What is it about you? Why? Because we're offended. God would choose somebody other than us. Instead, as we reject the gift of God, God gives us a gift, we reject it and judge it and find fault with it. So watch this. Paul is basically saying, look, it doesn't matter what any of you think. It doesn't even matter what I think, speaking of himself. I am what I am, he said in one place. <laughs> and it goes on. And all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now watch this. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because, see, as we go down just a little bit farther, we're going to see how Paul came to know the gospel, how his knowledge in Christ came to pass. 
But what happened is people who had heard Paul then found fault with Paul and started giving place to others whose messages they preferred to Paul's. That's basically what happened. Sound familiar? <laughs> I mean, it's an amazing thing when people start getting a little bit off. You know the last person they go to? The one who's in charge. You know who they go to? They go to anybody but that person, and they frame things in ways that will judge, that will just, that people will join them in justifying them in what they want to do. That's what people do. That's the exact same thing he's talking about to the Galatians here. I've watched it through this ministry for decades. I'm going to show you a couple things as we go on. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, this is a strong statement. Paul is basically calling down on himself, if he deviates in any way from the gospel that God gave him, curse me, God, curse me, God, curse me, God. And if anybody else comes and preaches something different, then curse them too. It's a strong statement. You think the gospel's important? Now watch this. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. He says it two times in a row to establish this truth. This is doctrine. This is something you can count on. Now watch. For do I now persuade men or God? See, when you go around trying to persuade men to agree with you, You're trying to find a way around God. Let me just tell you. For do I now persuade if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So, remember years ago, uh, it was probably in the 90s, um, one day Davy was praying, and uh, the Lord said to him, he said, you're an idolater. He's like, what do you mean I'm an idolater? Lord, I left all that stuff. I'd been part of the Catholic Church. I knew all that stuff. I've left all those idols behind. He said, you're an idolater. Davy couldn't figure it out. A lot of times on these, and I don't remember the particulars in this instance, it was some weeks before he all of a sudden understood what it was. It might have been quicker in this instance, but ultimately what the Lord showed him was this. When he feared what other people thought of him, he put them before God. He made an idol out of them. When you're more concerned what somebody else thinks of you than you are about what God thinks of you, you're an idolater. So here's Paul. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Personally, I want to be the servant of Christ. Now watch. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Important words. Is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in, times past, in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now think about that. It's amazing. I can tell you. Have, you have, Remember I was saying to you the other night, I was talking about the people who have come through my office even in Northfield Falls when I was there. Just I, I would say easily 100 people came through my office who I only met one day, met one time. And uh, they would come in, and they had heard something of me. 
stuff like that, and they would come in and they'd say, well, look, somebody was telling me about you, and they start telling me about their issue. Sometimes they were ministers and they were talking to me about something and I shared something. Sometimes they were parents of a child who had an issue. There's was a lot of different stuff, okay? Uh, one, just one straight situation. Um, but there were a lot. And I would tell you that I'd say 100 times I had people come through and 100 times people would go, it was kind of like their jaw dropped kind of thing and they'd be like, wow, I, that, that's exactly what I have been looking for. I mean, you are, that's, thank you. Thank you so much. I know that the Lord is with you. I know that that which you have just shared with me is what the Lord would have me do. And I'd have to say out of those hundred people, I don't think there was a one. Oh, there was one. I, can, I remember, there was one who did it. The other 99, if I heard from them, and I'd periodically hear from them on the phone or something, this would almost always be what they said especially the ministers. The ministers would call me back and they'd say, well, I was talking with some other ministry friends of mine and they were saying, no, I shouldn't do that, I should do this. Suit yourself. And Paul here, you see, if he had gone to the other Pharisees, if he had gone to his relations, all the people who esteemed him in his place, do you think they would have been telling them that this whole thing with Jesus was a good idea? See, he says, immediately I referred, where does it go? Where am I? 16. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and abode with him fifteen days, but other the apostles saw I none say, saw I none save James the James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Okay, he's saying these things to him, and he's saying, "Look, you guys may not want to believe this, because what were they doing? They were people coming up from Jerusalem who said, "No, no, no, you got to do this, that, and the other thing," and they were saying, "No, you don't. That's what Paul's saying is not what you're supposed to be doing." And everything. He's saying this not because he's trying to look at me and how great I am and all the other things. He understands how critical this is and what a dangerous situation they find themselves in. And so he speaks plainly to them. And he says, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. Then 14 years after, so he sees Peter for two weeks, right? And James, well, 15 days, I should say. 14 years later, he goes on. I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. This was where we look over in Acts 15 where he went up um, because there were those people saying that the Gentiles had to keep the law. And he went up to Jerusalem about the matter. And uh, it says, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you." But of these who seem to be somewhat, watch these verses, but of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing unto me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought 
effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. The same was mighty in me towards, toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with that dis their dissimulation. By the way, Barnabas is spoken of way back in chapter 3 or 4 of Acts. He was part of that early, early Jewish church. And it says, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Remember whose faith I was saying I'm saved? The faith of Jesus Christ, his faith. That's why he could take a guy like me who had no faith in him and transform me into the man that stands before you because it's not about my faith, it's about his faith. All right, so watch this. Um, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified, again, by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness cometh by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. All right. The reason why I brought this up is a couple of things. If we turn over to Joshua chapter 1 next. And Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. He wrote the book of Genesis. And he wrote the book of Genesis. Was not there. By definition, he couldn't have been there. The last book of the book of Genesis concludes with Joseph's death, basically. And Moses was born long after Joseph had died. I mean, he certainly wasn't there before Noah and the boat, right? He wasn't there before Noah and the ark. He wasn't there on the six days of recreation as covered in Genesis chapter 1, verses, what is it, 2 to... 28 or 29, something like that, two to the end of the chapter. He certainly wasn't in the Garden of Eden. How did he do that? He wrote it by revelation. How do scholars think he did it? They think that there was a, they think there was an oral history or manuscripts that had been provided. Let me ask you, the Gospels, written by who? Matthew, he was with Jesus, okay? Mark, he was not with Jesus. Luke, he was not with Jesus. And John, he was with Jesus, okay? So two of the four Gospels were written by guys who were with Jesus, all right? And in that, do you think the reason why John was able to write it is because he had just taken really wonderful notes during Jesus' ministry? He'd been going around. Jesus had said, look, John, take this down. You're going to want it later. You're going to need to record this. Um, no, he, those guys didn't know that Jesus was going to die, he told him he was going to die, 
But they didn't believe him that he was going to die. Remember? Isn't that what happened? I'm going to go up to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be delivered into the hands of the rulers, and they're going to crucify me. Peter says, not, not so, Lord. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things of God, but the things of the world. Right? Isn't that what happened? They didn't know he was going to die. They didn't know they were going to be writing something called the gospel. They didn't know they were going to be writing something called the, the epistle of first and second and third epistles of John, the epistle of James. James wasn't walking around with Jesus when he was around. Remember, he went in there and it said he was in that one synagogue and they said, the people say to him, your mother and brethren standeth without, desiring to see you. Jesus, mightily impressed by this demonstration of um, familial affection, goes, who is my mother and my father and my brethren? And then he looked upon his disciples and he said, these are my mother and my father and my brethren. What did he say? Not my father, my mother and my brethren. Okay, so that was what uh, uh, Jesus did, all right? What happened is they wrote those words by revelation as well. Okay? The Lord was able to quicken and bring back to remembrance things. None of them, for example, um, would have been able to describe Jesus' trials in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know why? They were snoozing. I don't know about you. I don't take particularly good notes when I'm snoozing, and I'm not particularly aware of what's going on around me. Okay, see, people, because they learn something a particular way, they believe that's the way everybody learns everything. All right? Now, as you turn to Joshua 1, um, I'm going to just hold real quick. Go to Luke 1. I want to show you one other thing before we go to Joshua. Okay? Because I mentioned how Luke was one of those guys who uh, wrote the gospel. Who was, who was Luke? Anybody know? Was Luke a Jew? He was not a Jew. Who was he? He was a Gentile physician. That's who Luke was. Wh who did Luke? Who, who, Luke was part of whose ministry? He was a part of the Apostle Paul's ministry. Now, watch this. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 1, verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also. Now watch these next words. Having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Perfect understanding of all things from the very beginning. Perfect, but he wasn't there. How did he have perfect understanding of all things from the very beginning if he was not there? Well, I'll tell you, it's one of two ways. One way is God gave him the revelation directly. You know another way? Paul shared the revelation God had given to him with Luke. You know, Luke wrote the book of Acts, right? Was Luke there on the day of Pentecost? No. Was he there when they decided we better add a 12th apostle and they decided to create, you know, draw lots and establish that guy, uh, Matthias, as an apostle? Was he there when Paul was converted? Was he there when Peter raised uh, that guy from the dead or when he, when he went and ministered to Cornelius in his household? He wasn't there for any of that. Was he there when Stephen was doing the, how did he do these things? I mean, were they, did God say, all right, look, I'm going to do something really cool with, Pete, with uh, Stephen today. So I want, uh, let's see, which of you guys should I get over there? Um, hey, Megan, will you go over, don't intervene. I mean, Stephen's going to die. He's going to get stoned and stuff like that. I don't want you to do that. I just want you to write every word as he says it. Can you take shorthand that quick where you can write every word he says and then also describe accurately the scene and the way everybody else does things and stuff like that so you can, with discernment of what was in everybody's heart, describe perfectly what was going on. And then when I open up the heavens, I want you to know you look up too and you're going to see me standing, okay? 
Um, doesn't matter if anybody else can see, but you're going to see me standing, all right? You think that's what happened? See, what happens is people, what people believe these things are is these are embellishments. They believe they're dramatic flourishes and people working from a manuscript and they're making it out to be something, you know, that'll be more dramatic than what was really there and stuff like that. Why? Because that's what they do. <laughs> that's what they do to try to make their things. That's why ministers practice their sermons and they practice the delivery. And if you're Joel Osteen, you record it. And if something came out not perfect in the way you said it and the gesture you used, you go back when nobody's in the thing and you get on there and you, you revise it and you re-record it and you put that in there. That's what he does. They said it's exactly the way he wants it to be with the perfect presentation he wants with all the perfect gestures, and he practices these things. It's, it's just like, you know, Brad Pitt or some actor doing stuff, okay? There's nothing spontaneous about it or of the Spirit of God about it. It's the sleight of hand of man is what it is, um, and the like to try to get into people's pocketbooks and ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Okay? That's not what Paul was. That's not what Peter did. That's not what Jesus did. That's not what any of the apostles or prophets did. That's what man does and calls it serving God. Some ministers are sadly serial liars. <laughs> serial liars. It's horrible. It's horrible. Should not be. But they do all the time. So over here, what I wanted you to see is that Luke is saying he had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. Now, with that understanding, I want to come over here to Joshua. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of God of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. Now watch that, Moses' minister. Does that mean that he had been over Moses and training Moses through the years? No, Moses' minister means he was Moses' servant. Joshua, much like Timothy with Paul, much like Elisha with Elijah, served that man as a bond slave to that man. You see women like Abigail and the like, when she came to David, she referred to herself as the Lord's, as my Lord, referring to David's handmaiden. Handmaiden is the same term for bond slave, only the feminine term for it as a woman. Okay? You saw that with Alicia. Remember the great woman who made the room next door for, on the, but did the addition to the house and set up a candle and a little thing like that for Alicia so he'd turn in there when he came? She was married, and she served her husband faithfully, but she recognized who Alicia was and valued who Alicia was, and so therefore created a place for Alicia to be able to come and rest himself. She was a handmaiden to Alicia. So Joshua was a servant unto Moses. Um, Moses didn't say, hey, Joshua, get over here. You're going to be my servant. Joshua decided, I want to be with that guy. <laughs> and so he was his servant. He made himself a servant. Nobody had to tell him. Go be Moses' servant. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. So, in other words, what he told Moses, he's now going to bring to pass with Joshua. Okay. From the wilderness in this Lebanon unto even the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and under the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto the fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do, watch this, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Now think of that. So whose word was Joshua keeping? 
He was keeping Moses' word. Don't get me wrong. God gave the word to Moses, so it was literally God's word. But G. Joshua recognized that the word that Moses said was God's word, not Moses' word. And so what was he there? And it, took, it had to be strong and of a good courage in order to do what? He had just watched as 599,998 people rejected it and died. And only he and Caleb didn't. Think that's easy? You think that might inquire, require a little bit of intestinal fortitude and some willingness to suffer and maybe be ostracized and not accepted by other people? And people think, what's the matter? Who do you think you are? What are you doing? Why do you always do that? You're such a kiss, you know what? I remember when I first came to the Lord, you know what the men in the ministry used to say? They used to say, Steve, you'll make a good wife someday for somebody. That's what the guys used to say. You know why? Because I served them like what they would have perceived a wife doing. Coffee, different things like that. I got it for everybody, male or female. And so they would watch me do it, and their thing was, they'd kind of sneeringly say, you'll make a good wife someday, Steve. Who else stood with Moses? Only Caleb, and not in the same way Joshua did. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success." Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now, I bring that up. Let's go back over to 1 Corinthians 1.10, which is one of the verses we brought up at the beginning. It's at the, uh, in our Articles of Faith, we have a preamble. It's not an article. It's like a little statement in the center. And it's this verse from 1 Corinthians. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, Last night, I'll read one other thing. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse... That's yeah, not too far along. I read this. I'll begin with verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You see the echo of what he was saying to Joshua? In the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. All right. Why? What if I just laid all this foundation work down for? People who are part of this fellowship and have been here for years, generally been here for a couple of reasons. Probably the most important one is, and I just say, there's never been another place where they've come across where the word of God was so perfectly preached. That would be what most people's thing would be. They've just never heard, no matter where they go, they've never heard that. The reason is, not because of me, okay, it had nothing to do with me, but because God revealed that word to a man in a time when the whole church was heading the other way. 
The whole church was heading into apostasy. The whole church was turning from the Lord and walking in all these newfangled doctrines. The church is the bride of Christ, for example, and he's coming back for his bride. Um, and we have to make ourselves all ready and beautiful and everything for him. It sounds like the exact opposite of what Paul was saying about to Peter when he called Peter to account for talking about going back to the law and stuff like that. If we, being Jews by nature, know that no man is justified by the law. Really? We're going to put that on them? Forget that. You're wrong. And he said that in front of all those coming from James, who was the Lord's brother. He said it to Peter directly because Peter was wrong. And he said of them all, that in conference they could add nothing unto him. That sounds like, man, I am proud. I am the best. I'm greater than everybody, doesn't it? I can tell you there wasn't that much of that in Paul for saying that. Paul hated to have to say such a stupid, ignorant thing to anybody. Do you know how much scorn you get for ever saying any such stuff? Can you imagine the measure of just total scorn that people give you for saying such things? I mean, people scorn you beyond measure for simply speaking a truth like that. They scorn you beyond measure. Let me tell you, I mean, it was funny. I mean, my wife said to me the other day, we were chatting, she said, well, you know, Steve, you talked a little bit about yourself here and stuff like that, and talk about struggles you've had. Like, I've talked to think people about struggles I've had. I've talked to people about not struggling. I've talked to people about everything. It doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> it's extraordinarily frustrating at times um, because, you know, the thing is, is you have to use examples of things that are real. I personally have real examples I have real examples. I mean, my son was really raised from the dead in the presence of many of you. It was real, okay? It was not fake, okay? I said to Jean Terrell, don't worry about that other thing. She's never had a drink of alcohol again while at the time she was coming out to the minister's conference, she had two six-packs in the car with her while she's driving, drinking them down as fast as she can go because she could never go a day without drinking. And she wasn't, she's never drank again since then. Okay? I've seen things. I took Corey to go confront different things. And without even having to show in court, watch the judge release him for having done nothing but wrong. And then another judge release him into my custody. I have a lot of experience of God moving in and through me. Okay? I actually do. I have a tremendous amount of experience that way. I want everybody to have just as much or more. I have zero interest in being some great man of God. I have no interest in people going, well, we, you know, we, I got received the gospel at Steve's hand, or Steve baptized me, or any other thing. I could, I don't care about any of that. Oh my God, no. Oh my God, no. But I do want to see you walk in these things. I am nothing special. But what I want you to see is that the differences in what happened here is that God revealed his word unto a man who nobody would accept received it. I accepted that he received it. Not because I was there. Not because I was there. I heard the word at his hand, and I knew this was true. God just gave it to me to know it was true when I did not believe there even was a Jesus Christ or there was a God. All of a sudden, I not only believed, but I believed that this man, kooky looking as he was, with, you know, Coke bottle glasses, big belly, thin in hair that was kind of long and straggly, um, living in a place of no account with a bunch of no account people and stuff like that, and um, having no money, anything. I mean, we had our rent was $500 a month, and we were late on that half the time. And there was 13 of us living there, pooling resources. We didn't have anything. Let me just tell you, nothing. And yet I knew 
that the fact of the matter is what he was saying was true. And I cleave to that word. But the sad part was I was really to a large extent alone in that. Many of you who were around then are still around. You're around. And the things we've talked about this week are every last bit of your variance, every last bit of your rebellion, every last bit of that. God wants to take away and not just take it away. He doesn't want to just take it away and wash it away and say, we're taking away. What he wants to do is he wants to redeem it all, much like Joseph's brethren. He took all those decades of wickedness and of alienation from God and transformed it into something beautiful and good that qualified them to be patriarchs in God's kingdom, sitting on thrones for eternity, judging the tribes of Israel. That's an amazing thing. What was their qualification? They were screw-ups who finally came around to the place where they realized they were screw-ups and they had done wrong. The first generation didn't enter in because they didn't believe Moses' word. Joshua was being told he had to stand and believe Moses' word. He didn't get the revelation. He didn't receive the word by revelation. He didn't watch the movie screen go by and show the whole thing. But he had to stand in that word that was given without compromise. And what did we read over here in 2 Timothy? And the things that thou hast heard of me. This would have been Paul preaching. The things that Timothy would have heard Paul preach among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Will you be those faithful men who will humble yourself to get shed of the variance, which is a work of the flesh, get shed of the strife, which is a work of the flesh, get shed of the rebellion, which is a work of the flesh, get shed of all of that stuff and humble yourself and come before the Lord with meekness and meekness that you can be engrafted in and receive the full benefit of the vine and bear much fruit. Is that what you want? Are you willing to repent and receive that? Now, look, I, as I say this, I want you to understand a thing. There's been a move going on for the last five years, so it's not something that, like, this is the first time these subjects are coming up or that people have not been making that move. Do you follow what I'm saying? I, I don't want to in any way say that that has not been the case, because it has indeed been the case. It's been a great blessing to me to see that be the case. But if you look, and let's go back down through here in Joshua a little farther, and I want to, most of you don't know, there might be a few who know. Robin was there, Ann was there, Kim was there, Carrie was there, Jim would have been there, Rick would have been there. Uh, let me think if there's anybody else who would have been there. Charlie would have been there. Okay. 1993. That's a long time ago. A long, long time ago. 1993. We were in Morrisville, Vermont. We had just done a two-week revival in, or I think it was two weeks, in George Gruner's backyard. And uh, we were there, and... Davy was talking about the Saltus coming, as I believe what the message was about, if I remember. And he was about ready to go out on the road. And he took a team with him. Despite me going, me, 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 he said, no, not you, not you, not you. Stay here. No, but I don't want to stay here. All right. He went out. And let me just tell you, folks, those of us who are around utterly failed Utterly failed, complete 100% pure, unadulterated failure. It was not his failure, it was our failure. That's what happened. It was our failure. Now, what had happened, because these things I've been teaching this week about some of this, this stuff about uh, you know, Galatians and about Ephesians 4.11 and Ephesians 3.2, about you know, the 
build your house on the rock, and that foundation is Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and the apostles and prophets being the remainder, and that Christians build their life on that rock, and they become a holy habitation for God to dwell by His Spirit, and we're able to go forward and do things. We saw over here in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16 or whatever about how He's seeking to bring us to get to perfect us in the saint and the perfect us in the faith that we can come together as a single man, perfect unto a perfect man as a body, much like the children of Israel did here under Joshua. And what I'm basically saying to you here, folks, is we're at the place to do the same thing. I actually stood up at the end of the revival. I don't know if anybody remembers this. I remember it very much because I'm the one who did it. It's amazing because there's tons of things I don't remember that I did, but I've always remembered this one. And that was we were on the last night, and Ricky Baldwin had gotten up and had done a prayer after Davy's thing. And then I got up, and I read this. I'm going to read it to you. We're going we're to keep going. I'm going to take you all the way through Joshua as I read it. So I'll read a couple verses before what I said. Verse 10, after God has told him, you know, be strong and with good courage and keep the word that I gave to Moses meditated and all that stuff he says then in verse 10 then joshua commanded the officer of the people saying pass through the host and command the people saying prepare you victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this jordan to go in to possess the land which the lord your god giveth you to possess it and to the reubenites and to the gadites and to the half tribe of manasseh spake joshua saying remember the word which moses the servant of the lord commanded you saying the Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren, armed all the mighty men of valor, and help them, until the Lord have given your brethren rest as he hath given you. And they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side, Jordan, toward the sun rising. Now watch this. And this is what these three verses are the verses I read that night in the tent way back when as a two-year-old Christian. I think people probably thought I was precocious and I wished they wished I would shut up. I'd actually, during those first two years, there was time Davey used to do a Sunday night discipleship meeting and he always ran it. Um, one time I started speaking, and I realized later, I didn't realize it at the time, I realized it later, I was prophesying, and I was speaking, so Davey just left the room, left me in there with him. I'm speaking to all people who were more senior than me. I was the one who was under the dog. I just want to remember, I was still under the dog at this point. He had not elevated me. I was not a licensed minister. I wasn't a Christian worker. I held no paperwork at all, okay? All I was was a disciple. Um, and I had no, no thing. Almost everybody around me was an ordained minister. If not an ordained minister, I, they were a licensed minister. You wait around to do things? No. You serve the Lord. You don't have to wait for anything. I just started speaking, and the Lord was having me prophesy, and I spoke to the people. And then another time, he left and let me run the whole Bible study on a Sunday night, which was really odd, especially since I was the young one and I was under everybody. But um, you know, the Lord was with me. And so I read these verses, and I read them with respect to Richard Utzler. I said, and they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. Think of that for a moment. Is that an amazing statement? All that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. When you're a soldier and you're in the army, isn't that what they do with you? There's a war going on. We're sending you to Afghanistan. But I don't really want to go to Afghanistan. I don't like the desert. It's kind of hot and cold there. I, is that what happens? No, they... They say you're going to Afghanistan. You know where you're going? You're going to Afghanistan. If you don't go to Afghanistan, what happens? You get end up in the brig. You end up in prison. In the old days, you just got shot. That's what happened to you. You would get shot. George Washington shot such people. 
okay, father of our nation. But he was commander in chief, shot people for such things. Okay. Um, he said, All that thou commandest us, we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. And I said, According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words, all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death, only be strong and of a good courage. Well, gosh, I mean, it's bad enough already that they're saying they're going to do whatever he says and wherever he sends them, they're going to go. But now they're saying, and if they don't, somebody done, we're going to kill you? Think that's serious? That sounds pretty daggone serious, doesn't it? See, kind of the modern equivalent would be that the person in the New Testament would be the person goes out of the church. Now, I share that with you from this perspective. I'm actually not asking you guys. I'm not here to demand anything of anybody at all. You guys can all do exactly what you want to do. I really, I mean, that's purely 100%. Everything you do is between you and the Lord. It's not between you and me. But if we're going to go forward and fulfill that thing of 1 Corinthians 1.10, where we all speak the same thing and we do these kinds of things, we haven't been doing that. Let me just tell you, as a body, we have not been doing that. We have not been doing that. I listen to folks. I can see folks struggle with the doctrine. I see folks struggle to get it. I see folks struggle to operate in these things. I, I get it. I'm not saying that what's going to happen on the heels of this revival, that tomorrow everybody's going to all of a sudden be perfect and entire and not lacking nothing. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, I'm, what I am asking is, is that something you want? Do you want that? I mean, if you don't want it, I mean, what's it to me? But if you want it, are you willing to make that kind of commitment so you can get it or no? Because, look, I mean, to me, one of the best examples of all is Luke. Luke's a Gentile physician. He goes up with Paul to Jerusalem. He watches as everywhere they go, the Spirit's telling Paul, don't go. And what does Paul do? He goes. What does Luke do? He goes. Paul gets arrested. What does Luke do? He stays. Paul's there for three years. He stays there for three years. When Paul goes on a prison ship to Rome, Luke goes on the prison ship to Rome. Can you imagine? I mean, the guy had just watched. It is, this guy's he's disobeying God. The Spirit's telling him not to go. And what's he doing? He does it anyways. And what does Luke do? He sticks with Paul. Did Luke get blessed out of that? You think that might be why Luke got the, uh, wrote the book, the gospel according to Luke? You think that might be why Luke wrote the book of Acts? I would, I would bet you it was during that time that that's when these things came forward. Okay? Now, I bring it up to you from the standpoint. Now, what, would, what do we do? I knew that wasn't of God. See, you can't trust him. Isn't that what we do? We judge and parse everything according to our own understanding, not trusting God at all. And we think we're doing a great thing. We think we're doing a great thing. I'm here to tell you, you haven't been. You haven't been. That's not a great thing. It's not a great thing. Did Paul prove in the things he did that he was but a man? Oh, absolutely Paul proved that he was but a man. Did Paul ever pretend to be something other than but a man? No, Paul never presumed to be anything other than but a man. Do you follow? He didn't. He considered himself chief of all sinners present tense, not past tense. He wasn't referring back to when he was killing Christians. He was talking about himself as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, unto whom the other apostles in conference could add nothing. 
he still saw himself as chief of all sinners. Okay. What the whole thing comes down to, folks, it's not about man. It's not about woman. It's not about the person occupying a particular position. But, you know, I think you can see, I mean, the one thing I will say for myself, for those who have known me for a long time, and there are a lot of folks in this ministry who have known me for a long time. I mean, I am have obviously grown over that time. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I haven't stayed stagnant and just the same person the whole time I have grown. But I, I do believe over those number of years that I have demonstrated that uh, I'm dedicated to the Lord. And I'll do whatever. Doesn't matter what it is. I'll do whatever. And um, if in that and what the Lord has done through me leaves you with the belief that <laughs> uh, he's just a charlatan or whatever, you know, I mean, fine. I mean, it, <laughs> I, I, you know, it does not matter to me. It does not matter to me. But if you actually can see the truth of who I've been among you and what I've done among you and stuff like that, I mean, I have been the one who kept the word that Davy preached. It's the reason why it's still here. <laughs> I don't mean that nobody kept any of it. I don't mean that. I, I, I really don't. Don't hear me wrong. But I can tell you there are so many things that the only reason why they're still known is because I had kept them while he was alive. And other people had already let him go. Just so many things. Things that he taught 10, 20, 30 times in front of people. They still had them wrong after all those years. It blew my mind. They were comfortable with their variants. They were comfortable with their own opinion. It's amazing how many of those people are dead. Sad. They're not that, they weren't that old. They didn't have to be dead. But they are. Okay, God's word is serious. And I don't mean in their dying that that means they went to hell and stuff like that. I'm really, I mean, I, I'm not saying that. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not God. <laughs> you know, I'm not, you know, God doesn't go, Steve, should they go to heaven or hell? You know, it's like, not like in the Roman Colosseum, you know, this or that, you know, I mean, and I have no, in my opinion matters nothing in any of that. It's between everybody individually and the Lord. It's not between me and anybody. Okay, but I, I have um, a lot of experience in the Lord on different things. And I know that the reason why I'm here now and the reason why we're doing this revival this week is because I still believe that God is going to bring to pass Ephesians 4 in this fellowship. That's why we kept the conferences going. That's why I said that the Lord showed me to bring everybody along. So in so much as lieth in me to do that, I am seeking to do that with all my might. And I know that the time we are in is in a time where it's going to take, if we're going to see things turn around in our nation, and our communities, it's time for us to endure hardness as good soldiers. It's time for us to not be wrapped up in the affairs of this life. It's time for us to humble ourselves, to submit ourselves unto every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, okay? To submit ourselves unto the governors as unto him that is uh, supreme and is sent to, you know, uh, for the punishment of wrongdoing. Not because they are sent for that. They don't. They often punish the ones they should, they should uh, who are doing right, and they give a pass to the people who are doing wrong. So, I mean, look, our government stinks. But... The only way we're going to see a turn is if we submit ourselves and in that meekness of wisdom and love go forward. Isn't that what Daniel did when he dwelt in a land that was ungodly? Isn't that what Mordecai did? He even saved the king's life, warning him of a, uh, of a uh, plot against him. Okay, isn't that what uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego did? Isn't that what... Uh, Esther and um, 
Ezra and Nehemiah did. Okay. And didn't God move mightily on their behalf? Okay, I mean, look, this process, you see it over and over and over and over again. It's the same formula. Humble yourself before God. Recognize your total dependence upon him for all things. And he will move mightily through you. Don't be after vain glory. Don't be after trying to be somebody. Don't try to be somebody. I have tried to be somebody. I've tried to be an apostle, Lord. I've tried to be different things. It don't work. <laughs> trying to be something doesn't do anything. Okay? Trusting God to move through you to the accomplishment of his will, that accomplishes great things. And that's what I've learned over the time. I've learned in the end to stop, Steve. Cease, <laughs> desist <laughs> from all work. And rather trust him. And let the works that are going on in and through you be his works rather than your own. And see, that's what he's seeking to do with all of us. And then we will come together as one. We will all speak the same thing. The doctrine we will preach and the gospel we, we preach will be the same. It hasn't been. It hasn't been. It hasn't been. It hasn't been. Tragically, it hasn't been. But see, the gospel of our salvation is a liberating gospel, an extraordinarily liberating gospel. And it can liberate anybody from anything. That's the amazing thing. Its power to liberate is there's nobody outside of its capacity to recover. And that's what he wants us to walk in. And recognize when we recognize our own depravity, then we can look at others and not see theirs as a big hurdle. We see it as a big hurdle when we see ourselves as better than them. When we don't, none of it's a hurdle. I mean, look, if you guys think the country is bad now politically, the people who I used to consider, consider conservatives, like Bernie Sanders, conservative sellouts. That's what I perceive Bernie Sanders, like the day before, the day I met the Lord, considered him a conservative sellout. I was a way far more radical guy than him. Now, uh, things have turned. If they could take me from where I was and bring me to the place I'm standing before you today, there's nobody out there he can't touch and do that with. It's an amazing thing. And if he could take you guys out of the stuff you've come out of, who out here can he not reach? I mean, oh, my God, have we not, like, so much of what's going on wrong in society, have we not ourselves experienced and been a part of? So if he can do it with us, he can do it with them. That's the whole thing. That's why he has this crew. And he's got a, a from me to you, he's, that's a pretty wide expanse of different kinds of people. So, look, I know last night at the end I did pray with, um, I, we'd taken it off, and I prayed with uh, James and with Jeannie because they were heading. What I'd like to do tonight, and this, because I don't want to have people coming up. When I have people come up, people generally feel like obligated to come up. I am not interested in anybody coming up out of any obligation whatsoever. Personally, I think the best thing for you guys to do is just go get alone with the Lord in your own closet. Go get alone before you do anything else. My experience is, I can say that, we'll go outside, people start talking, and people forget about it. And they won't go do it. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, but the scripture says that when you pray in secret, he'll reward you openly. I think if my admonitions that way were followed more faithfully by folks, I would have seen the reward you more openly, more frequently than I have. Um, and so I, my sense is, is that a lot of times that's not happened. So there's kind of this middle ground, which I believe the Lord will uh, let me stand in with you if you want, which is I don't want people to look at anybody else. I don't want people to do anything. And the people out there, and if you're out in Grace Ranch and you're listening in the chapel there, what I'm going to have people do is I'm going to have people who want to join in the prayer I'm praying. I'm going to have you stand up, 
and I want everybody to close their eyes. Even if you're not going to stand up, just close your eyes. I don't care. Just everybody close their eyes. I'm having you close your eyes for this one reason. I want you to understand. I want you to close your eyes because I don't want you to see what anybody else is doing. So what anybody else is doing is none of your business, and it's none of my business. It's between them and the Lord. We're going to make a little closet here in which where you are, it's going to be between you and the Lord, and where I am, it's going to be between me and the Lord. And those who wish to stand up and join, I say, stand up, lift your hands toward heaven. I'm going to pray a prayer. If you agree with the prayer I am praying and want that prayer to apply to yourself, then just say amen quietly to yourself. You don't have to say it so your neighbor hears you. God will hear you, okay? Because this isn't about some outward show to anybody. But I want to reach everybody who wants this, those who are listening to this live and those who are listening to it on a recording or whatever. If you are interested in partaking of this prayer, I'm praying, then stand up right now, close your eyes, and lift your hands towards heaven. And just say, Father, I lift each of these people who have joined with me here tonight and desiring to hear this prayer. And I, I want you to understand, Lord, you wait to the end with each of them. And when they say amen, may it be so with them. If they don't say amen, then be it not so, because I'm not here to impose this prayer on anybody who doesn't want it. Okay? But Father... I submit myself unto you, and I submit all those who join with me here. Father, that perfect man that is spoken of by the Apostle Paul over in Ephesians 4, where it says that till we all come together in the unity of the faith under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ unto a perfect man as a body of Christ, that comes in perfect oneness with you, Father. That same prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17, that we would come under perfect oneness with you, Father, and oneness with your Son, Jesus Christ. And that that same glory that you put on him, that you would put on us, that we may be one with you, and that the world may know that thou hast sent Jesus that people may know that Jesus did indeed die for their sins, just like he died for our sins. Father, that the love wherewith you have loved him, as Jesus prayed, that it would be in us, Father, that your love that you love Jesus with will be in us, and that the world may know that you love us just as you love Jesus, because you have adopted us into your family, Father. We are no longer our own. We are part of your family. We have a new heavenly Father whose business we want to be about entirely and no other business, Father. We willingly submit ourselves unto you to be of service to you in any way we can. Your scripture says that we may give, that you ask us to give our bodies a living sacrifice which is our reasonable service. And Father, we submit and agree and cleave to you and pray, Lord, we give you our reasonable service, that you would balance each of these things out perfectly, that we may be husbands that are pleasing to you in ministering unto our wives and loving them as you have loved us, that as wives we will submit ourselves unto our own husbands, and I'm obviously not a wife, but that they will submit themselves unto their own husbands as the church does unto you, Father, that the fullness of the blessing you have for the wives to partake of may be accomplished, that the children here who desire to partake, Father, that you would bring, put in their hearts and minds a willingness to honor and submit themselves and obey their parents, that the fullness of the blessing you have for them as children to partake of, they may be able to receive and come together. And, and Father, that you would fill us with your spirit in the fullness of that love that you walked in, Father, that we may love one another with the love, with the love wherewith you love us, Father, that we may love one another in like manner, that we may be people who have no greater the love but to lay our lives down for our friends, which is our brethren, Father, that just like you laid your life down for your friends, the eleven, 
Father, may you bring us together in like oneness, and may we love, uh, may we love our brethren in like manner, being willing to lay our lives down for one another. And Father, may you endue us with a capacity to walk in your love and to walk in kindness and gentleness and forbearance and forgiveness and long-suffering, and that you'd fill us with bowels of mercies, Father, and that you would grant unto each of us truly a humbleness of mind. And Father, we take authority over those carnal minds which have plagued us, which are thine enemy, which cause us to be at variance with you. We want nothing to do with that carnal mind anymore. And I just take authority in the name of Jesus over that carnal mind, and I cast it off and put it off, Father, in the name of Jesus. And I ask that right now you'd help each of us to put on true humbleness of mind, to put on true meekness, Father, that we may be engrafted into you, the true vine, and that we may be, that that, that, that graft may take and work perfectly, and that we may receive the nourishment we have need of from you, Father, that we may each bear abundant fruit for you, Lord, that by that fruit that people will know that your love is real, that your gospel is real, and that we are your servants, Father, and a people through whom they can come to know you because we know you by walking in your love. And so, Father, I pray that you would bring us together in this perfect oneness, Father, that you would teach us how to put on and operate in the full armor of God, Father, that you would make use of our spirits day by day in the battle and guide and direct and open up our eyes that we may rightly divide and perceive the spiritual battle, recognizing that the people are not our enemies, but rather we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And may we become wise to how to win those battles that the people may be set free, Father. And may you just fill us in a new manner, Father, with thy love, with thy grace, with thy mercy, Father, that you'll wash away our sins and that you'll redeem and teach us out of those things and grant unto us a true humility and meekness that we may receive wisdom and instruction, that we may receive chastening, Father, with thanksgiving in you, that we may be able to go forward yield with that chastisement, yielding the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our lives in our relationship with you, that we may indeed truly go forth as one man in you, all having the same mind, the same judgment, and speaking the same thing, Father. May you please, in your extraordinary grace and mercy, accomplish this extraordinary work in the hearts and minds of each of us who have prayed and joined with me here in prayer this night. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, ladies, you can come up here, and we'll have you guys do uh, some songs, and we'll send off that way. Um, I, uh, if anybody has any questions, you know, I'm going to be here both after this service, but I'm going to be here for a few more months before we go to uh, South Africa coming up. Look, folks, just get with me. The Lord wants you to have answers to your questions. He's not here to play hide the ball with you. He wants you to succeed. He really does. And I know he can. And I hope, I hope you understand where I've been coming from this week and that which I've been sharing. I certainly do not mean to put anybody down. But I do know that if we're going to go forward, we have to acknowledge the truth. Because it's the truth that sets us free. So ladies, take it away. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. that's what it's about. His amazing grace that saved a wretch like me.
and for each of you that he saved a wretch like me. Praise God.
ਦੱਸੋ ਜੀ